Andrew, Dominic, had you, like the cameras on all the time, right? It wasn't just, you know, action to cut. He started saying 50-50 and I had no idea. Do you know what 50-50? No, I have no idea. Okay, 50-50 <laughs> was like, keep rolling and don't say anything. Wow. So he dressed the entire crew in period clothes. So they would come in to do touches or Jessica to give me a note and he kept rolling. So all these processes that I had in between takes, saying my lines or feeling horrible or yes, I like that, whatever was happening in between takes, fixing my wardrobe, whatever, mm. it's on camera. And a lot of that's in the movie. You, yes. you feel the texture yes, of that, yes. but I didn't realize yes. that was, it was done. So when time. I found out what 50-50 was, <laughs> I was well, like, Wait a mm. second. <laughs> Hey, Hannah. Hey, Eddie, you? I'm so happy to be here with you. I got you. So excited because I've been a big admirer of yours for a long time. I remember going to the premiere of The Danish Girl. Really? Yes, oh and the gosh. after party, and I was just blown away oh, thank by you. your performance. So it's pretty surreal to be here <laughs> with you today. Well, it's, um, yeah. it's a complete treat for me. I um, was astounded by your work in Blonde. It was one of those rare performances I've only seen a handful of on, on stage or on film where you want to go and hold that person afterwards and check that they're okay because yeah. it felt like you ripped open your soul for the sake of Marilyn and it was um, an astonishing thing. Yeah, um, so it's you. a treat. And also your range. I mean, your range is insane comparing that to, to Look your who's other talking. work. No, no, but it's, yeah. Can you just tell me sort of what your process was with Marilyn from the day you were cast? What were the first things you looked at? From the moment I got cast, that was almost a year before we even started filming the movie. Oh. The movie wasn't greenlit yet. Uh, but Andrew Dominic, the director, he had been like over 10 years already preparing this movie. So when he met me, he just wanted to pour all of this information <laughs> over me. It was very yeah. overwhelming. But also, I was just like right away, I knew he would answer all my questions. He knew everything. He had all the information I would possibly need. Yeah. And he had created this photographic Bible of the entire film scene by scene oh, wow. so it was very helpful for me to get into you know the timeline because the movie is not chronological it's no, not it's an impressionistic quality yeah too, yeah it? so yeah. it was a good reference to go back to when you would you know if you felt lost or something yeah. like that so the way in was just you know i had to learn pretty much everything about marilyn i, yeah. I didn't know who right. she was and the book was the way in and yeah. then the script and all these pictures and then just talking hours and hours for almost a year with, with Andrew. I couldn't aspire to anything higher than to feel the desire to make you my own. Am I right in thinking the book is a sort of slightly fictionalized version? Yeah, it is. Because I find that, it, I had this with the Danish girl, interestingly. You know, Lily's story was true. And then there was a book that she may or may not have written around that period about her experience. But then there was a book written in the 90s or early 2000s called The Danish Girl that was a fictionalized version, but yeah. with uh, all these shifts and changes. And I found it complex. And I'm uh, sorry, our script was a was a adaptation of that book. Yes. So I find it complex when you're playing, there is a true person. Yes. You're playing an adaptation of a sort of fictionalized version that you kind of, I found it complex to kind of wade through what, what truth I was looking for. Does, does that make sense? Yes, for sure, for sure. I think the, the what we tried to do, what Andrew Dominic tried to do in this movie was, you know, there is this kind of like photographic memory that we all have of Marilyn and stories and, and moments that we have attached to that picture, to that image. And we think we know what was happening at that time. So the, the film, what it's doing is like giving a different interpretation to those images mm. mixed with the story of the book, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know? So you just kind of like have to lean in into 
whatever it is that you were playing. I think that's kind of like what it's been tough for the audiences to understand about the movie. The emotional truth is so powerful in the film that it's hard to separate that from it's not a biopic. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So for them, it's like, you know, I've heard people like, you missed this part of her life. You you didn't touch these other moments. And she was not only sad or depressed or, and I'm like, I know, but we're telling that it's story. Special. Yeah. yeah. I found the real people that I've played. I want to so many but, questions but for if you. They're, <laughs> they're deserving of that story. Yes. They're deserving of m many interpretations of, yes. of, of that story. Yes. Anyways, I want to ask you because I've seen The Good Nurse twice. Oh, wow. I've watched it twice. As hard as it is to play a character where you have to do so much research and you have to be so specific about things, it's so hard to do what you do in The Good Nurse because you're boiling, but you never, <laughs> never boil over. Mm. It's just so subtle. It's so specific at the same time. It's so brilliant. And then you choose a very particular moment to break through and show not anger, but pain. You know, I don't want to talk about Parkfield. It's... Is it because what they're saying is true? Did you know about this guy? Did you see him before? Did you know his mannerisms? I didn't know anything about it. I read Christy Wilson Cairns' script and I was astonished that I didn't know anything about it. I was like, this guy might be the most prolific serial killer in American history who was aided and abetted by these hospitals that just moved him on. And I was stunned by it. But I was stunned also that it wasn't a story about a serial killer. It was a story about a relationship between these two people and had the most magnificent experience working with Tobias Lindholm. I cannot recommend him enough. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it spoilt me so much. He's a writer, he's also a director, he's also a wonderful human being. Yeah. And so for such an intense film, and also there's a responsibility telling that story because the, you know, the families of the victims, are yes, still, yes, it's yes. still very yes. raw and it was horrendous what he did. But I knew that in Tobias's hands, I'd be safe. And he insisted on like a month's rehearsal. We actually, it was six years in the making um, oh. since Jessica Chastain and I were, were attached. So I, how much did you know? I, I knew nothing, but there is this book called The Good Nurse, which is the last sort of third is our story. And the other two thirds are uh, the history of, of Charlie's upbringing, his trauma, all these insane things that, that happened to him. But we also had the real Amy. So wonderful to have someone to talk to, but also the fear then that you, you're you getting it wrong. Um, Charlie is in prison for many life sentences. So I, so, but there was lots of footage. I got to speak to Charles Graeber, who wrote the book, who spent a lot of time with him. Yes. But primarily it was the real Amy. And she described how kind he was, how gentle, how self-deprecating, and that there was this other human being that she only met twice yeah. this thing happened to his eyes like one eye drifts up and it was like a different human being but what what that gave us speaking to her was the knowledge that jessica and i could invest in the truth of the friendship and that it was up to tobias to find the cracks and he allowed us great freedom i know he was one of those directors that allows the takes to go on and on oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. and you never feel like the thought's got to happen quicker we've got to get on to the the meat of the thing he'll find the, the elegance in the silence yes was this the first real per person that you've you've played no it wasn't this is i think the second the first person i played was in this movie hands of stone and i was playing roberto duran's wife who i met i was friends with i spent christmas with them in, wow. in you know in panama and she was you know, Panamanians and Cubans are the same people, basically, yeah. and it was a completely different approach and a contemporary movie and, you know, all of that. But still terrifying when the person you're playing is going to watch. <laughs> watch terrifying and, you you know, what the, the things they like, yeah. they completely agree with, yeah. and the things they don't, they're, those, those are things that never happened. Yeah. You can make everyone happy. There comes a moment, doesn't there, when you have to kind of accept that. You just have to go, this isn't documentary. 
Correct. It's and not a facsimile. And I'm and from the outset, you go I, I go in going, I'm getting it wrong. I'm just gonna do my best and give my heart to it. Correct. And I think that that it's only fair that you also have your space to do your job. Yeah. You just don't wanna imitate this person, you just don't want to, because then it's very restrictive. You mm. have no room to do anything. You, mm. you have nothing to explore. You have nothing to create new, to add to the character. So to recreate that the idea that they have of that person is just not possible. Very boring as well for us to play that. To, to have a complete fa facsimile, basically. Yeah. About the two versions of, yes. of you know, Marilyn and Norma Jean. Yes. There's just one moment that early in the film, once the characters transition to you playing her, at that first screen test. The audition, yeah. It is so stunning what, what you do and what Andrew Dominic does. The moment when you look and the camera pans off and, and, and I was desperate to know what was over there <laughs> and, and, all the, and all the people in front are desperate to know. Yes. And the camera, and it's, and it's it, that moment when you're looking, which is shot from the wings. Yeah. That was the moment when I completely found I was looking entirely at the interior life of this person because yes. it's complex to begin with that yes. you have your own associations with the images and the thing. But I thought that was extraordinary because it was in that quiet moment when you were looking out and you had conned, oh sorry, Marilyn had conned all of those people just yes. in that one look to be yes. oh, like what she, it was a very yeah. beautiful and, and poetic moment that I felt was the, 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 the key into her interior life. Yes. Yeah, that's just a it, it is one of my favorite scenes in the in the film too and it is it, it really shows you how commanding she was and how magnetic she was and and how good of an actress she was yeah. and then what was taken away from yeah. uh, after that moment such a powerful work that she did and what happens afterwards with these people commenting after she leaves that really shows where these movies going no. to you know the film about marilyn and i did was a, a film called my week with marilyn yes and it was i believe a true story maybe apocryphal but it was when she was making the prince and the showgirl it's one of and my favorite movies of her and i think she is that performance that she gave in that movie is incredible i mean she was so effortless and having so much fun and she ate him with potatoes i know literally. I mean, <laughs> oh, I she it. was just you could not you you could you can't take your eyes off of her. It's incredible. What she was going through yes. at the time, you know, the yes. emotional turmoil, how difficult she was on set as far as Olivier, yes. Lawrence Olivier was concerned. Yes. And yet what I found, the crux of the piece that I found so intriguing was that Olivier had all the technical capabilities in the world. Yeah. But she had this innate thing. Yeah. And, and, that, and that sparkle, as you say, yeah. like when you know how complex the making of The Prince and the Showgirl will, and then when you yeah. see that light delicacy that she yeah. has, it's kind of overwhelming. Yeah, he was very threatened. Yeah. He felt very threatened by her. Mm. But that light and that thing that she had was expected, mm. is what she was supposed to deliver. Mm. And one of the reasons why I really liked this movie and I fell in love with this role was because it's just not fair to only be that one thing, you know? Yeah. She needed more dimension to who she was, you mm. know, even though it's the difficult part mm. or the, the dark side or, but it was also true. The same way she was not always um, in this state, that was something that she was going through as well. Yeah. So I think it, it is important in the movie to show that in depth because it is part of the person yeah. and it was true yeah. what happened yeah. because you, you don't end up, you know, dead at 36 years no. old if no. everything was amazing and no. perfect, no. you know, so. There's something also about that notion of, of family and the weird thing about our jobs yeah. is, and we were talking before this about, you know, you going from job to job to city to city and and to these new families. Because to do our job, you have to be vulnerable. You become very close to people very yeah. quickly. And there's a there, there's such a complexity to that because it is a reality that, but it's yeah. also, I find when I go on to the next one, I'm like, oh wow, that I, I never learned that feeling of, of loss. Going, well, I thought we were, 
I thought we were family, you know, and then you go on to the next one, like... <laughs> that only oh, no, happened this... to me in my first movie when I was 16. Really? I was devastated when devastated. it was like, this is it. <laughs> Everyone's leaving, going back to Spain and their countries and everything. And I was like, no. Yeah. But I wanted to say something about what you uh, mentioned before about these two personas. And I think the movie is, um, also talks a lot about that, this public self mm. and private self. We all have that, Yeah. you know. Um, Even oh, if maybe more than one, oh, oh. <laughs> I find some, I like have no idea who so, I am. I sort of shape more. depending on who. Yeah, I'm and and I feel like you know, in her case, was so exaggerated even more because of these expectations and because of this character that was created that she had to learn how to turn on mm. when she needed it, and at the same time, the real Norma Jean was completely unseen and. Nobody was really paying attention to that. Mm. You know, when you're, when you're a child and you're told that all the bad things that have happened is because of you, that you were not wanted, that everything is your fault, that you're bad, you will spend your entire life looking for that love mm. that you didn't get. There was something very interesting in the movie that Andrew told me. You, he was like, you can't express anger or rage. Right. She cannot afford that. She can't have that because that would push people away and she can't have more rejection. Right. So she was just so open and giving and giving and giving that that became her lifesaver and at the same time a prison because she just couldn't do anything else without Marilyn. Yeah. You know, and at the same time, it was a trap. She couldn't get out of it, and, and that I could understand. Uh, yeah. How do you manage to navigate life and an industry so powerful that wants so much of you, or completely the opposite, spits you out yeah. <laughs> if you're not needed or wanted anymore, or you know, attractive or whatever? And, and what do you do to stay there longer yeah. and to feel that apparent? love or mm. or feel wanted by people even though it's not who you really are they want something else yeah they want a version yes they want that version of you it's pretty devastating horrible yeah. <laughs> so when you did the scene that i can i can i can see mm. in, in the interrogation room that choice i mean do you always think of your choices what you're going to do and you talk to you warn people i'm going to do this mm. <laughs> or you just it's in the moment and you just did how did you think about that well we had spent a long time discussing the rest of the script with christy our writer and jessica and i with with tobias and we felt if we got that right then these scenes would reveal themselves and mm. tobias did this interesting thing i basically wasn't introduced to noah and namdi who played the officers mm. until that moment and I'm not sort of method, but that was something that Tobias had generally mm -hmm. um, encouraged. Mm -hmm. But also when I arrived in there on the set, he had my wrist locked up and I, I didn't know that was gonna happen. And it was interesting that in that scene, I'm like an actor that qu I quite like working with intentions. I worked with a brilliant director on stage years ago, Dominic Cook, and he, it's this Max Stafford Clark way of, you know, every line you, you give an intention to. Yeah. And my overriding intention for that scene was, despite the fact that he's broken and completely lacking any power, was to tr somehow try and retain the upper hand. And so my intention was to try and throw them off. And it was interesting because just in the first take, we, we just, there were 10, 15 minute takes. And just in the first take, I heard this noise well, Noah was chatting to me and I saw him go, so I was like, oh, I might do that again, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it became this sort of battle between us, oh. which he then, Noah then just absolutely out of nowhere screamed at me. And it was, it was so, he's so brilliant, Noah, and it was very frightening. And it's the moment that I'm almost most thrilled with because you don't see, you don't hear about Charlie's upbringing. You don't hear about his trauma, yeah. but he was abused age seven. Yeah. And in that moment, you see the seven-year-old. Yes, you know? 100%. But, but he kind of galvanizes yes. himself and then comes back to kind of punch through. Listen, hey, you can, Charlie. Yes, you can. 
Hey, 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 enough of this shit. Enough of this shit, Charlie. I can't, 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 I can't! There was a moment in court the judge was giving out his um, opinion and a lot of the victims' families were there. And Charlie, with that, that arrogance, just started shouting to the judge about his ineptitude and how, and, and, and this mantra built and built and built to a really violent place that he ended up being bound and gagged in court. Wow. So it was also trying to find that moment. It was intense days, it but was, it was getting to work with brilliant actors and just it's like, It's incredible. I was so surprised. I was not expecting oh. <laughs> that to escalate, that yeah. to get to go there, you know? Yeah. It, was, it was it was one of my favorite moments. Oh. I mean, the, the whole movie, you feel for this person. I really like him too. Mm. I mm. think I will be, you know, his friend. Yeah. And at the same time, it's like so evil. Yeah. It's just so dark and it's so sad. And then you hear also about his mom. Um, yeah. Do you think you wow. know now why he did it? Do you have your opinion about it? It's just such a good question. When I read the script, I was like, well, why? Like, why did he do it? <laughs> and, and it's that human instinct to want to know why. Mm -hmm. and, and the more I thought on it, the more I realized we want to know why. We want to give a reason mm. so that we can other that person. We can go, that person, this happened to this person, so they're a monster, and that's no, I, I would never do that, mm. you know to make ourselves feel safe as human beings. But actually, he never did say why. He gave a whole host of reasons, some of which don't make sense. Like for, to begin with, he said they were mercy killings because he worked in a burns unit, but then very quickly it was people who were getting well and, and by the end they were just deaths at random. Mm -hmm. So that's not true. I think his mother, so Charlie's mother died when he was 15. He was very close to her, he was the youngest child and he went to the hospital and they'd lost her body. Years later, after having joined the Navy and been thrown out of the Navy, he came back to that same hospital where his mum died mm. to train. I felt like there was something specific in that choice. And I felt like he was trying to, one of the reasons was trying to expose a system. And in those scenes when he's being fired. Oh my gosh, well, the it, movie exposes the system, system. Well, very, yeah. very well. But I, I love that Tobias, you know, the lady in charge, the risk manager is, is, mm -hmm. a, is a sort of villain of the piece. But then you also yeah. see all the suits, the men in suits, the lawyers behind her. Yeah. And it's that idea of like, we're all cogs within a yeah. system. And unless you have the power of the individual and, and reminding ourselves of the power of the individual yeah. to, to kind of supersede those yeah. things. Um, but for me, the great treat of this I've been doing these films like off scale and you know action and I imagine it's like the films that you've been doing as well there's yeah. th th there are so many skills to it and there are so many people involved yes. which I've loved they're kind of these grand symphonies of films yeah. but actually getting back just to having that intimacy that's of stillness working and, stillness and and the time and the, the yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, the, it's a really the playing of each other and like listening to each other and Thoughts. every take doing something different and, and yeah thing that I think we both probably have as processes which do all the technical work yeah. so that when you're there the camera can roam you respond to the actor and see what comes up really um will you tell me then about because Marilyn had such a specific process herself yeah I'm curious about like the the actual creation of the character because I found again playing real people everyone's like what I, I saw an interview with someone was like what was it like when you saw yourself as Marilyn and I was like it doesn't work like that it's it's yeah. each step of the way of yes. incremental working with your makeup team yes. and your costumier and with Andrew and yeah. and the DP like how did you find that collaboration first of all this is a movie that I think if the hair and makeup or something was like off it takes you completely out of the yeah. movie. Yeah. They really made it seamless. It yeah. was just perfect. And that, it was that did, yeah. you know, 50% of, <laughs> of my Not job. It, it was truly remarkable that what they did, considering also the, the very limited time that we had. Yeah. 
Um, the amount of looks as well. It's insane. Like, I had over a hundred looks. Yeah. It was crazy. But I was terrified. I mean, to find a voice and the accent was my biggest fear. Yeah. I was terrified. Who did you work with? Jessica Drake. Brilliant. Yeah. And I worked with her for almost not for nine months or so. I, wh while I was doing Knives Out and I was doing other oh my movies. God. So I was <laughs> coming back from set and then two hours on Zoom with her and then I finished that and then we started like getting on like in person four hours a day. But the brilliant thing about the voice is be because the voice is so known but also sort of in its essence, it's so theatrical. Like her, yeah. I feel like you go, oh, that's Marilyn's voice. Is this sort of hush? That that being out of ground it is well, but that was hard. I think I, what people people is familiar with her on screen voice, yeah, voice. Yeah. and also if you look at the movies, from one movie to the to the other, it's completely different. It's, yeah, because she was so insecure, yeah. and she wanted to sound more, you know, eloquent, and she she used to stammer too, and all of that. So she yeah. she herself had many different coaches mm. to change that. Mm. But anyways, the process with, with Andrew and we didn't break the ice in this movie with a little scene that she's walking down the street yeah. with no dialogue. <laughs> we went straight to Wait, which one? meeting mother at the hospital for the first time in like oh my God. years. Oh my God. So, you know, and I'm, I'm working with actors like, you know, Julianne Nicholson and, so and Adrian Brody and Bobby Cannavale and all these people they know her better than me, you know, and I was terrified. I was like, as soon as I open my mouth, everyone's going to start laughing at me. <laughs> what are they thinking? So I didn't want to be in my head too much mm. because then that would have been just a disaster. But at the same time, I knew that fear before speaking mm. is exactly what she was feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And it's about the... Yes. Yeah. And that... And, and you capture that, I think. Yeah. I used as much as I could of my own fears and feelings and all of that. When I played Stephen Hawking, the physicalities, the different physicalities, I had to learn in advance, a bit like a dance, in order that... I don't that, know how you did no, that. No, 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 but in I order really that when you're, when you're in those mo moments, you can improvise in between, as yeah, it were. Yeah, yeah. And am I right in thinking that Andrew Dominic uh, had you, like, the cameras on all the time? Right, so he was. So yeah. he. So from day one, you were having to. It wasn't just you know action to cut. You were being pursued. I, ha I had to. At the beginning, I didn't know what was going on. He started saying fifty-fifty, and I had no idea. Do you know what fifty-fifty? No, I have no idea. Okay, so <laughs> I was like, I have no idea, yeah. and I'm like, you know, I think it was like two, three weeks in, into the shoot that I understood what fifty-fifty was, and fifty-fifty was like keep rolling and don't say anything. Wow. So he dressed the entire crew in period clothes. My dad, like Jessica Drake, yeah. my talent really? coach, the hair and makeup people, everyone was in wardrobe. So they would come in to do touches or Jessica to give me a note about the accent or whatever. And he kept rolling. So all these processes that I had in between takes or saying my lines or feeling horrible or yes, I like that, whatever was happening in between takes, um, fixing my wardrobe, whatever, mm. it's on camera. Yeah. And and a lot of that's in the movie. You, yes. you feel the texture yes, of that, yes. but I didn't realize yes. that was, it was done. So when time. I found out what 50-50 was, <laughs> I was oh, like, Wait a mm. second. Wait, but, but then I, I went for it. But yeah. It was like 50-50, I'm, I'm, I'm going to. Yeah. That's interesting that he was hiding that going like, because sometimes directors don't want to intrude on something they want yes. to capture. But that's, so your relationship with Andrew Dominic, my God, it must have been intimate and yes. how did that develop? It was. Andrew is a very approachable person. He's very honest and he he has no filters for good and bad. Yeah. I think it's for good, yeah. especially when you're trying to get a very specific feeling and understanding of something. You sometimes need to be raw and yeah. straightforward with it. And so it's a very clear message. Yeah. And I like that. I'm that way too. So we connected very quickly and he has a very interesting vision of life and women and pain and trauma. That's why he fell in love with the project. It was a very personal thing for him. And that relationship for a whole year, I have never had this kind of deep work mm. with a director mm. before. Mm. He was so excited after 10 years trying to make this movie. It finally was happening. and. And he was just 
on all the time and we just talk and talk and talk. It was like a very true relationship, like friendship. Has it shifted developed. your expectations? Oh, and, and also for the future. Direct- I mean, my life is ruined now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I told him, I'm like, now what? Like, yeah. you know, we were lucky in a way that the movie wasn't ready to go because we did use that time. that time. Yeah, I mean, nine months for me, I would have used even more if I could have. Yeah. Because for me, I would have, I, I was never ready. Okay. You know, just but we, I need we to never do more. Are. Never, oh, we I, never are, I, I guess. It's so interesting yeah. that your first scene was in the middle there because I always have that moment, that extraordinary moment. And it always feels like the first time you've ever done it. Yes. And you start at the middle of a story, at some random bit of a character arc that you've prepped in a vacuum by yourself. I mean, yes. it feels like I want to ask about that too. Because I found the other day a notebook. I'm not really, I'm, I'm horrible at like keeping a journal and yeah. things like that. I can't, I, you know. But I wrote for like a week. I took notes when I was doing Knives Out. Yeah. And I was, I found it the other day and the entire five, six days that I wrote, yeah. every day was like, I don't know what I'm doing. What is this? I have no idea if, <laughs> yeah. what this character is like. I don't know what's going on. Um, how did it feel for you um, as a Cuban actress playing this American icon? I think at the beginning felt like, how is this Australian director thinking that a Cuban can play Marilyn Monroe? He's insane and I'm very happy I'm about it. About it. <laughs> yes. You know, it's, a, it's one of these roles that, that you think about and, and you see other people playing, but that's not going to be you. Mm. Not in cinema, at least. Mm. In theater, sometimes you get to play, yeah. you know, parts that are very far from who you are. And in movies, is, is a very different story. Um, so for me, like, getting this role was a, a very personal challenge. It was an opportunity for me to prove to myself what I could do, what, what, what my limitations were. And it was a big risk mm. because I knew, oh my gosh, if I, if I don't get this one right, yeah, it's it, terrifying. this is over. Yeah. I'll be raising cows and, and chickens in the countryside. I don't know, like I'll be doing something else. I will never work again. And then, you know, it's such a beautiful um, thing to, to work with because you realize that you do have a lot more in common and, and then you hear your people and your friends saying these beautiful things and how proud they are and you're getting all these messages and how they feel represented. And sometimes when, you know, in my case, I left Cuba and when I was 18 and I was acting there, but then I left and I feel like I haven't, I haven't done any films in Cuba since I left for a long time. So you feel like you go back and you see your friends, but you're not a part of that industry anymore. And, and you feel like you're gone, like they don't, they don't see you as a Cuban actress anymore because you're now working in Hollywood or whatever. And it's very sad, but then you see the reaction and then you understand how they really feel. And actually it's very personal for them too. So you realize that you were doing that for many other people without even knowing that they cared. Yeah, how amazing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And once the movie's out, I mean, I, I was just seeing this theaters in Cuba, they play blonde in yeah. Cuba, wow. in the theaters, original version with the subtitles and everything and for five or six days. And they were packed. Like the lines outside the theaters oh. were, you know, going around the corner. Yeah, and must be so inspiring It as well. was crazy. And I had no idea. You don't really understand how much you're affecting yeah. in a good way, in a positive way, these people's lives and, and and spirits and their dreams and intentions and you know what they want to do with their lives and it's it was amazing I, I i just had a bigger bigger it's bigger than you in some ways yes, yeah for sure there's something also though that's so i find like when we start acting you're at school or you do it like and you play everything and anything and then gradually yes. i always say to like young actors who are at drama school or university i'm like play as far away from what you look like as you can. Yes. Because the second you get into the real industry, yeah. <laughs> you will be playing to type. Yeah. And then what I find so weird yep. is for you, this part, or and for me it was Stephen Hawking, yep. suddenly you're expected 
to like having not or like having played for me anyway like to type for a while you're suddenly expected to play something take this massive punt without having done any of the steps yeah, in the, between yes, it's like a yes. long time Where since you played exactly. somewhere yeah, yeah. Like, how did i get there and so, so that yep. fear like when and that moment yep. when you get cast and you're like oh my god this is the greatest thing great bad now a what millisecond later <laughs> yes. a millisecond later yeah. it's like Oh, yeah. terrifying. Yeah, I remember. Um, what was that feeling like when you. Oh my gosh, it was. I mean, I was so where excited. Were you? Where were you? Explain. Yeah, I was so excited and I was telling Andrew, when are we going to announce it? Yeah. Like, I want to tell people that I'm playing Marilyn Monroe. And he was like, well, you know, this movie is falling apart many times. This movie is a heartbreaker, so be careful. Yeah. In fact, a week before shooting, the movie got no. canceled. No, 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 yeah. no, no, no. Yes, and I was, oh, everyone God. was crying, devastated, it was horrible. And then a week after, we got greenlit again. And Andrew was like, so you want to announce it? And I was like, no, just, <laughs> just, don't stop just making it. let it go. <laughs> yeah. Forget it, never mind, they will know when. <laughs> that yeah. emotional. Yeah, but, but it became that moment of, oh, now it's real. And I guess I have stop. to do it now. Now I have to do Every it. Every day. Every day. It was such a Eddie, treat. thank you. What a treat. Beautiful.